We're all here today to be part of the auspicious rebirth of the original Royal Naval Rum Toss, um, which for the first time in 315 years is now no longer the preserve of a lucky and fortunate few. By that I mean I'm referring to the officers and ratings of the Royal Navy between 1655 and 1970. On July the 31st, 1970, the, the rum top was last issued on board Royal Naval warships on a day that became known forever as Black Top Day. With the withdrawal of the rum tot, the Royal Navy didn't have anything to do with the reserved stocks of the Royal Naval rum. So we believe in December 1970 they were drawn off and put into with the clad stone flagons, which we have an example here. The stocks were only actually broached several times during the state occasions and also for the wedding of His, his Royal Highness Prince Andrew, obviously him being um, a member of the Royal Navy. On realising that the, these rum flagons had not been opened for nearly 40 years, uh, Sir Kinder um, and his brother Raj decided that they wanted to acquire the stocks, and over a period of the last four years, they've acquired the majority of those stocks in order for us to be able to bottle, bring back the rum together and bottle it as black top fast consignment. <coughs> Today, almost 40 years to the day, because it's the 40th anniversary of Black Top Day on the 31st of July, which is this coming Saturday, um, that very same rum has been bottled by Specialty Drinks as Black Top Last Consignment. It is a truly unique and remarkable rum. It's a marrying of the original British colonial pot still rums, predominantly from the islands of Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados and Trinidad. And it's becoming recognised, as more of you get to taste it, as becoming one of the finest tasting rums ever produced. As this is the last remaining stock, we felt it only fitting to use the term last consignment. And in light of the fact that supplies are limited, when it's gone, it's gone. And we can never repeat it. It is, in fact, a liquid piece of hist naval history. And it's got a story stretching back to 1655. So, as time is short this morning, and we have quite a lot to cover, I just want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing this morning, and then I will hand over to Dave Broom, who will speak to you about the history and development of the TOT, particularly giving an overview of the development of the TOT in the history of the Navy, but importantly where we are today. Once Dave has finished, Cliff and Ron, both veterans of HMS Belfast, will take you on a tour of Below Decks, focusing particularly on the, the preparation of the RAM prior to its issue. You'll then come back here for 10 to 11, where Brian will pipe up spirits in the ward romantic room, and we will move back to the quarter deck where Neil, Brian and Terry will reenact the issuing of the tot, of which you will all be part. It's important to note that today, 40 years after the last issuing of the tot on board Royal Naval warships, there are very few people who are still a bit kind of um, alive who experience the, the issuing of the top first hand. So take advantage of that. We have five on board today who are working with us and you can ask questions and get a better understanding of, of the whole process. Once we have, uh, once uh, Neil has taken you through how the rum was issued, you'll all be given a measure. So you'll all be able to taste for yourself this remarkable rum, while Dave will then take you through a kind of guided tasting so you can understand what you're tasting. And then after that, you'll be free to come back, get, pick up your bags and leave. Okay? Not Dave. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> nice night. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies, gentlemen. Uh, interesting, standing by what appears to be a fireplace on board. Uh, uh, <laughs> very unusual. And it's a great honour for me to, to be here uh, today, and thank you to Superintendent Nick for inviting me along and also uh, for allowing me to play a very, very, very small part in, in the, the creation of, of this fantastic uh, black pot, because uh, you kindly allowed me to write a little black book about it. So uh, uh, I just thought one way of trying to describe the history of the tot and the history of, of this rum itself is to actually take a look at where we are today, what location we're in today, because not just the fact we're on board HMS Belfast, where 40 years ago the last thought uh, was, was served, but where HMS Belfast is now moored, which is on the Thames, 
next to Boris's office, uh, <laughs> next to Tower Bridge. But think about what this river must have been like back in the late 18th century, 1783 to be precise. Ships coming in from the Caribbean, the, the whole river busy with trade coming in from all around the world. Sugar and rum would have been coming in here in vast, vast quantities. We'd be coming into Liverpool and, and Glasgow and, and Bristol as well. But what happened when it came into London is what's important uh, as far as the top goes. Because just across there is Sugar Key. Right next to Sugar Key, in 23 Harp Lane, <coughs> which is still there, number 23 was a, was a man called Mr. James Mann. Mr. James Mann started off as a cooper. He started uh, making barrels for the sugar trade. And then he began broking rum. And his offices were right next door to Seething Lane, well, one of my favourite addresses in London, <laughs> Seething Lane. I wish I lived in Seething Lane. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is where the Admiralty was in those days, before it moved to Somerset House. Mr. James Mann began, was given the licence to blend the rums for the Navy. He was given exclusive right to blend the rums for the Navy. It started just across the river from where we are today. I think that's quite remarkable. And the rum that you're going to be tasting later on was blended just down the river in Deptford in the great big Solera vats, the linked vats which were down there. The, the rums from around the Caribbean would be blended, brought into London, blended down in Deptford and then distributed around the world to, to the Navy. And I think it's important to, to emphasise how important the Navy was in creating what we now know as the rum industry. Because it was way back in those early days, you know, rum was just a byproduct uh, to, to begin with. It was you know, given to slaves, it was given to indentured workers, it was given to privateers, it was used as bartering. It wasn't really considered of any great quality until the Navy got out of it. Until the Navy began talking about this, this wonderful liquid which they were being given tots of, and which they would bring back in the ships, back into London, where this magical <coughs> transformation of the rum from this clear, hot, hellish liquor, as it was called, into something which was more mellow, which was richer, which was deeper, because it had spent time in sea and in barrel. And the popularity of rum really is thanks down, is really down to the Navy, it's spreading the word about how great rum was from these exotic lands across and man himself is important because man helped create what we now know as blending. You know, I'm Scottish in case you hadn't guessed. <laughs> you know, and you know, I hear Scottish blenders uh, in the whiskey trade, you know, saying, well, you know, blending started in 1853 with Andrew Usher. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it started across the road with James Mann and his sons <clears throat> and with other rum blenders throughout the United Kingdom who were taking <coughs> pardon me, disparate rums from Jamaica, from Barbados, from Guyana, or, or Demerara, as it was then known, as it was then known, Trinidad, blending them together, finding their different qualities and making something that was consistent and of high quality, which is why the Navy wanted to blend, because they wanted a consistent, high quality product, maybe made up of different component parts, so that they, the, the quality of the, the liquid spirit being given to, to the Navy through the three years was the same. <coughs> so blending started, so it's thanks to the Navy that blending starts as well. <coughs> it's okay, I'll go back up to Scotland and tell them. <laughs> and also, I, I think it's important to, to, to think that, you know, way back, you know, when Admiral Vernon uh, gave his, uh, old Grodd himself gave his uh, first order, that you could say that the British Navy invented cocktails as well. Uh, and that's something which isn't necessarily hugely written about, you know, just back from Tales of the Cocktail, but, you know. Uh, Admiral Vernon did say in his order that the new twice daily rum ration, you know, it had been doled out uh, you know, in vast quantities uh, prior to this, he, that twice daily rum ration be augmented with fresh lime juice and sugar to make it more palatable to the crews. They were drinking daiquiris, folks. <laughs> yeah. These, you know, these wonderful sailors, they were drinking daiquiris, sit, sitting there in the Caribbean, sipping a daiquiri. The British Navy invented cocktails. 
and blending. I created the rum industry. And what we're doing today is really looking at the way in which the whole, this <coughs> bottle, this liquid that which we're going to be trying later on, reaches out into the world. It touches all the people who served on, on board, on board uh, the ships. It now, it touches all the people who made the rums over there in the Caribbean. It reaches into the past, or to, to man, and all the people who, was, who were involved in the creation of, of this remarkable, and truly remarkable rum, all over the years. And it now it kind of reaches itself out into yourselves and the wider public as well, because as Nick says, you know, this is the first time that the, the wider public have been allowed to understand why servicemen in the Navy were so passionate about the quality of their Navy rums, and we'll come to that in a little while. So this is a special day. It's a special day in a special location with a very, very special rum. So I look forward to seeing you later on when we finally actually manage to, to broach it and, and have a talk together. Okay, thank you very much. What we want to do now is to split you into two groups um, because the corridors down below are quite small and quite low. Um, Cliff will take one group and um, Ron will take the other. And we would like, Ron is just at the door, and Cliff, Cliff is over there. So I suspect if you just make natural break in the middle of the room and one go one way, one go the other, um, we can start the tour. We're gonna, we, want, we want Cliff and Ron to focus on the, what went on down below, as I said earlier, in the preparation of the rum, so that when we get to the rum ceremony, you'll understand um, everything that led up to that. Um, and then obviously we'll then taste the rum. So if you'd like to follow Cliff one, one. and Ron. I think the half of you, sorry, do you want to say yeah. something? There is another naval expression which says three deep in a big heap, stand by, go. <laughs> From here, Alan, <laughs> <to> follow Ron. <laughs> Otherwise, you remaining behind will follow me in a moment or three. We'll let uh, Ron get slightly ahead, because as you can imagine, the ship is somewhat congested. Um, we've heard a little bit about words that uh, have become adopted into the vocabulary of Britain. I just want to mention two. When you talk to sailors about life on board, and particularly in the days of sailing ships, you would always hear them say, ah, oh, they're hardships. Think about that word, hardships, and that, of course, has become part of our vocabulary, meaning uh, conditions that challenge the individual. The other one, of course, that was equally invented, not too far from here, is the hangover. Does anybody know how the word hangover was derived? Well, all the taverns around this part of London, particularly the Pool of London and going out towards the East End, were full of taverns and landlords who wanted the sailor and his money to be quickly parted. And what would happen is the hordes of girls would get them into the pub and slowly fill them with whatever they wanted to drink and take their money with them. And the landlord's last cry was always, keep them in overnight so that tomorrow morning we can serve them breakfast and take a little bit more. But the question came, by then everybody was in a state of flux, and so the barman very kindly thought about the problem. And they strung a piece of string across the bar, and they hung the drunks over it until the next morning. And I kid you not, that is the origin of the word hangover. Fortunately, you can carry your own away these days without the indignity of hanging over. So let's make our way onto the quarter deck. What I'm going to do uh, is to take you through the main deck of the ship, because we don't have an infinite amount of time, and I will be taking you along the exhibition deck. I hope I will whet your curiosity and appetite, not for the rum, as much as to come back and have a look at the ship uh, proper, because she has got A, a wonderful record, <coughs> and B, to come and have a look at it, particularly if you bring the children and the grandchildren, who have lots of questions, it's an interesting morning or afternoon. So follow me and get a, a feel for HMS Belfast, a cruiser. Thank you. 